nod if you can see the slide up on my screen. Great. Okay, then I'm going to kick us off. Um, I'll ask my colleague Mariana if you can just kind of keep an eye on that waiting room. Are you able to admit folks? Yes, I am. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh -huh. Well, great. We will kick off then. Welcome, everyone. It is so great to see you um, virtually again. Um, it's felt like a very long time since we last convened in May. Um, I hope you're staying healthy and well. And once again, we just want to open with a big um, thank you for your continued dedication to this work, um, despite the, the really challenging circumstances we're all living through. Um, we uh, have a little bit of a different format tonight. A couple of you heard me say this, but if you are a task force member, we welcome you to kind of put your video on uh, so we can kind of simulate that environment. If you're joining us as an audience member, welcome. We're so happy to have you. Um, we would ask that you um, keep yourself on mute and off video until the public comment period, just so we can make sure the task force members can see themselves. Um, and, you know, before we begin, I just want to acknowledge, you know, we canceled our, our June meeting and we really appreciate your patience and flexibility around that cancellation. Um, as city staff, we're all continuing to adapt our work um, and support for our city as we continue to experience the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as, as our city and our nation grapple with calls for defunding the police and broad calls for systemic change uh, to begin to address racial injustice. So we felt last month that it was really important to allow time and space for those community actions um, and to postpone our conversation. But we are really excited to be back together tonight, jumping in right away into the details. We have a lot of ground to cover. Um, and so we're, we're really excited to get going. So I'm gonna start out as I always do with a Zoom orientation, um, just general guidelines, mostly the same. Please remember to mute yourself when you're not speaking. Um, as always, we have a lot of content to get through, so we'll ask that you hold your comments and questions for the designated discussion times, and we'll be really clear about when those are. Um, and then we have the raise your hand feature that we'd love for you to use um, when, we, uh, when we are um, trying to have that discussion so we can get you in the queue. I'm just looking, we have the raise your hand feature within the chat window, is that correct? Seeing some nods. Okay, if you have any troubles with that, just let us know via the chat. And um, that's the next kind of guideline. We like to keep the chat open for technical troubleshooting. And my, my team will help me here uh, navigate all the different screens and, and get you the support you need. And then as I mentioned, for our audience members, we would just appreciate if you um, could, could keep yourself on mute and turn your video off. So quick run through of our agenda tonight. We've got some housekeeping items at the top that we always go through. We'll share some project updates, what's been happening on the staff side. Um, for the last two months. And then we'll dive into our first of uh, five pricing typologies that we are exploring with this group, and that is parking pricing. So we'll have um, a guest presenter, Chris Arms from our parking division, will share um, some information about pri parking pricing in Portland. And then we'll put some new seed ideas on the table for you all to respond to. And then we're uh, gonna reserve as much time as humanly possible for getting into small groups and doing a really fun interactive exercise and dialogue um, using our equitable mobility framework to look at those seed ideas. And then we'll wrap up. So before we go any further, are there any um, questions or edits on the meeting summary from our meeting five in May? Going once, going twice. Are we seeing any hands, Mariana? I'm not seeing any hands. Okay, no. great. Thank you. We'll consider that final. It's on our website. If you notice anything after the fact, please let us know, but we'll keep moving. Um, I also want to thank Hal, who noted that the raise hand is actually in the participants window, not the chat window, but thank you for flagging that. Okay, and we do have um, some audience members on the phone this evening, and so I would like to see if any of them would like to use the raise your hand function to provide public comment this evening. So I'll wait a couple seconds to see if anyone jumps in that queue. Not seeing any hands go up. And we did not receive any written comment in between meetings. So then with that, we will move along. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Shoshana to walk us through some project updates. Uh, thanks. Good evening, everyone. Um, nice also to see you again um, virtually. 
And yeah, I'm just going to start with a couple of projects, sort of administration and parking lot updates um, since last time we met. So first, um, hopefully some of you remember that we have a project strategy team that is sort of helping behind the scenes to set up these meetings, these task force meetings, and to sort of think about the information we're bringing and discussing with you all. Um, and, and the strategy team is made up of staff from uh, PBOT as well as staff from BPS. And we've also had a community organization representative who's been part of that strategy team. And for the last year, the community, sort of as we've set up the task force, the community representative has been Maria Hernandez Sego Segoviano from Opal Environmental Justice Oregon. And Opal was actually receiving some grant funding to capacitate that work. Um, Maria has since moved on from Opal and Opal has decided they have to focus on some other organizational priorities right now. So, and we're super deeply grateful to Maria and to Opal for sort of helping us throughout the last year as we got this process set up and getting us to this um, portion of the work. Um, and at this point, we're transitioning. The Energy Foundation, which was providing the um, grant support, is transitioning to providing some support to Verde uh, to continue providing sort of community partner capacity, even sort of behind the scenes again in how we think about setting up this work and the strategy team. And so uh, Vivian Satterfield, who you hopefully all know, she has been a task force member participating with you all. Um, and she is actually going to be transitioning um, from a task force seat to a project strategy team seat. So she's still part of the project, um, but will be in that project strategy member role um, from this point moving forward. And we're super excited uh, to welcome Vivian and have her continue in that capacity. The second is that we, we've heard from you all um, an interest in sort of continuing to see more data about the status quo and equities. And we've mentioned in several of our presentations sort of snippets of data and pieces of, of the inequities that we're seeing um, across the board. We're trying to pull that together into sort of a more of a cohesive snapshot um, so that we can, we can show information that we have across the sort of many mobility indicators that we have. Um, and we're hoping to have that ready for you in the next month, maybe to, to, to be able to tell that story in a sort of an easier, clear, clearer way. Um, I, I see Vivian is uh, sharing a chat about being grateful here and, and acknowledging Maria has a, um, has a, she has big shoes to, to follow. Um, thank you again, Vivian. Um, uh, so that the snapshot will be ready soon. Um, then finally, as well as Emma alluded to, and as we're, you know, we're going to begin talking about actual pricing policies tonight, and we're also going to begin to use the equitable mobility framework that we um, have been working on together. And as we've discussed, as we've been putting that framework together, it's really meant to be a living document, a living framework, and we expect to continue to refine it as we do our work together. So with that in mind, the POEM strategy team actually has a few suggestions for additional updates this evening that we believe will strengthen the way the framework is used to prioritize policies that benefit Black people, Indigenous people, and people of color. And I think on the next slide, there we go. Um, so at the top of the framework, um, it states across the top, it talks about who we're prioritizing and it states that across all of the indicators or the things that we care about, we would prioritize providing benefits and reducing disparities for Black people, Indigenous people, and other people of color. Recent events have reminded us of the importance of, create, of really creating safe space for BIPOC communities and it, we just feel like this cannot be overstated right now and if we cannot provide this safe space, we won't be able to achieve the other goals of the, or any of the goals of the equitable mobility framework. So we've actually added, we're recommending adding um, improving safety. So the top line would read, this framework prioritizes extending benefits, reducing disparities and improving safety for BIPOC communities. Then the second addition, um, which you can see below in red, is because we also want to be very clear about why we're centering race. Um, and it's really because racism is a contributing factor in the disparities that we see across the framework, across the indicators we care about, across in mobility, in health, in safety, in economic opportunity. And this means that addressing racism itself must be part of the work of creating a more equitable transportation system and a more just society. Um, so that additional language we believe strengthens, strengthens that statement. And then the last 
um, recommended change is also in the language around personal safety. And we had also we had already discussed together, I believe we talked about this at the May meeting, um, tweaking the language a little bit, but we have an additional recommendation for a language change in the personal safety area um, to strengthen it from uh, before we had ensure safety and perceived safety by individual users in the public realm, and now suggesting ensure freedom from threat and fear of emotional, psychological, and physical harm when using public space um, to really acknowledge some of the threats and, and lack of personal safety um, that BIPOC communities in particular face. So those are some um, significant changes. Um, again, the strategy team is recommending that they help to sort of strengthen and um, are in the spirit of what we've can we've been continuing to talk about together, because of the all of the all of the information we have to share with you tonight, and because we want to leave time to really start to talk about some of the parking um, issues, we want to keep it moving. Although we we again sort of want to acknowledge this is a living. Um, a framework and a living document and we invite you to sort of think a little bit more about this between now and the next meeting and if you have any immediate thoughts um, you can definitely email them or give us a call at any point and we'll leave a little bit of space at the beginning of the next meeting again to talk about um, to sort of get additional feedback sorry my dog was scratching at the door for a second um, uh, to, so we can we you know we want to continue to work on this with you all together so um, the other thing before we dive in is just a brief reminder of where we are in the process and where we're going. And this is um, last time we showed this updated work plan. Um, and tonight you can see again sort of phase one checked, phase two checked, although we're going to continue to have some of these ongoing conversations about learning um, from COVID, learning from racial justice, um, or learning what what continued calls for racial justice mean for this process. Um, but we are beginning phase three tonight. And in phase three, we'll be, you know, really starting to focus on some um, pricing strategies and either pricing strategies like parking we'll talk about tonight, which can be specific to the city of Portland, or in the case of tolling are, um, are not just um, specific to Portland, the regional conversations, but they're near term regional conversations. Um, and we really feel like it's important to start talking about them to get some impact input from you all so that we can, the city has some of that input as they engage in these regional conversations. Um, so I think the next slide. So this one is a little bit of a closer look um, at sort of the plan for moving through these conversations over the next few months. Um, and again, tonight we'll dive into a process that sort of more or less we hope to be going through on several different topics with you all. Um, we'll start to introduce a topic. Tonight we'll introduce parking. We'll talk a little bit about, you know, why do people price parking, how we're doing it um, today in the city of Portland. And then we're going to throw out some seed ideas to, for us all to start to consider if there are additional ideas that could potentially help to move the bar along and create a more equitable system, a more climate friendly system, um, and use we're, the discussion again, we hope to get to tonight is to use the equitable mobility framework to help have that conversation. Um, so we'll do that, we'll have similar conversations on, on other um, pricing topics moving forward. At the same time, um, a little bit later in the fall, we hope to get some additional technical analysis um, that we, our consultant is helping us do to see, you know, from, based on some modeling, based on research, where, where it looks like different policies may help to move the bar from a data perspective. Um, so we hope to then bring sort of the discussion and the ideas that are emerging out of the discussion about what may or may not be a good idea together with some information we're getting out of the technical analysis and see if any of the ideas are moving forward as if they have some potential, um, in which case we can sort of go back, revisit ideas, further refine, think about what, you know, what, what design parameters, what, what sort of qualifications would we need around a particular idea, what complementary strategies, what recommendations for, um, you know, revenue investment, if there's revenue, things like that, um, as sort of how we'll move through the process to develop recommendations. Again, if, if there are recommendations that come, that come out of this process. Um, and then the last thing before starting to actually talk about 
um, parking is we just want to sort of acknowledge for a minute that the city is not always the implementer. Um, you can see in the box on the left that there are, um, you know, there are some strategies that city council can enact themselves. They can enact new parking fees or regulations. There are some things they can do around regulating commercial fleets or other areas, curb access or other right-of-way access um, the city of Portland has control over. We are going to be talking uh, um, at the same time about some strategies that are bigger than the city of Portland. Um, tolling, again, we want to talk about because it's an active regional conversation um, and the city of Portland will have influence. Um, however, ODOT will be implementing tolling if, if that moves forward. Um, you know, future other strategies that are probably pretty far in the future, like a potential vehicle miles traveled based charge where you're charged um, by mile that you drive. That's something that likely would Im be implemented at the state level, potentially, again, years in the future, the city could add on a local chart or a local vehicle miles, tra uh, blah, vehicle miles traveled um, price as well. And according, again, if in the future it were to be a thing that seemed to emerge, um, it's, it, you know, we could think about according that the city would do, but it would likely have to involve a lot of interjurisdictional um, collaboration. So we still, we want to talk about all these things with you all, but know that there's different paths forward um, depending on who is the implementer. Um, so with that, actually, we, before I, before I transition to parking, are there questions about any of, any of those things? If you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand. We'll pause just for a minute. You know, we just, we threw a lot of updates at you. This is how fast this project moves <laughs> when you don't see each other <laughs> for a while. Stephanie, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Uh, yes, I wasn't, I'm not familiar with the term EMF screening. Oh, thank you. This is, it's good to have acronym um, watching. Um, and I can't go back for some reason. I will fix that. But um, EMF is Equitable Mobility Framework. So that's our shorthand. Oh, I beg your pardon. Okay, thank you. Of oh, course. I beg your pardon. We shouldn't use acronyms. <laughs> no, no, I'll, I'll know going forward. Because it also has to do with, um, well, never mind. Thank you. Great. Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands. So in that case, then I think we'll dive into the meat of the matter and I will introduce um, our first speaker, Shoshana. Oh, right. No, um, remember, I'm doing one or two and then introducing Chris. Never mind. Yes, you're doing one or two. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this is the problem with too many screens. Yeah. Um, so yes, in a second, I will introduce our first speaker, Chris Arms. Um, but f um, first, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so before handing it over to Chris, who's going to talk about what the city of Portland actually does, and I also want to acknowledge we could have like a whole, you know, course on what the city of Portland actually does um, for parking pricing. So all of these things we're going to try to move through again pretty quickly, give you sort of a little bit of information and then allow some time to talk through knowing um, knowing that you all come to the space with different um, sort of understanding so far and you know and if and we're sort of trying this to see if we can we can share some information and have some discussion um, knowing you're not parking experts and this may be a lot of information so let us know um, uh, you know after the meeting how this works and if we need to do things differently moving forward but um, with that, just, you know, at a, at a super high general level, we wanted to talk just for a minute about, you know, in, in general, why would you even think about pricing parking or even managing parking? Um, and, you know, the answer is really that there are many people, we, our, our city, our nation, our world is set up so that many people need to drive and, and park to meet their needs, to go to jobs, to go to school, doctors, things like that. Um, at the same time, we only have so much space um, in our city and people's driving and parking choices are not only impact them, help them get where they need to go, but they do also have impacts and costs on other people. Um, so, you know, at a high level, parking pricing can help to send some price signals, which can discourage pricing um, and in, you know, in turn to reduce the amount of driving that's happening in a city if people have other choices. 
Um, and it's sort of in the same way, pricing can then help us to use the available city space that we have in the most efficient way. Um, this can leave space to support other travel modes, walking, biking, transit, things like that. Um, and pricing and, and managing parking can also help to support commercial activity and commercial services um, or just other services in general. And, and managing, tool, managing parking can also be a tool to give priority or accommodations for certain vehicles, like those using low carbon fuels or parking for disabled users or delivery vehicles or any number of things that can be a tool to do that. Um, and then finally, Parking or pricing is a tool that can help to, cap to sort of better capture the true costs of driving and parking a car, things like air pollution, carbon emissions, road maintenance costs, safety, things like that. Um, also, the last slide before I turn it over are just that there's a, there, you will hear from Chris about a number of different parking tools that we use and we will be continuing to talk about some others. So there's a, there are many different sort of types and categories um, of parking pricing that you can, you'll hear about. And there's one common disti distinction is between on-street parking, meaning parking um, in the public right-of-way or public space, which can be free or it can be priced with meters or with permits. And then there's off-street parking, um, meaning parking that happens in parking lots or in garages. And again, this can be free, it can be priced, and it can be publicly managed or it can be privately managed. And to that end, tonight we're actually gonna break down um, and talk about strategies in the two buckets of public parking and private parking and public being managed by the city and um, private parking being owned and managed by a private operator. And the reason we're sort of breaking them down like that is just that there's different tools that you can use in regulating of private parking and public parking. Um, also acknowledging that to really sort of shift and meet different goals, you would have to use probably tools on, on both public and on the public end and on the private end. So that's the, um, you know, again, sort of super high level different types. And now um, I want to turn it over to Chris Arms, who's PBOT's Parking Operations Divi Division Manager, to give just a quick sort of snapshot of some of the current parking tools that the City of Portland uses. Hi, everybody. So um, I'm just going to go through, um, as Shoshana said, a, a quick summary of the tools that we currently have and the policies that have been adopted by Council to help us manage the public parking. So there's three primary um, tools that we have. The first one being meters, and there's five meter districts. And each of them have a different uh, rate, an hourly rate, and different um, hours of enforcement. And it helps us to manage the parking specific for a district. So for example, Lloyd has a different meter rate and different hours of enforcement than the downtown area or Northwest. So we try to tailor the the needs to a specific district. The second tool is permits. So there is a area parking permit program that was established in the 80s and that helped us manage uh, commuter parking. And you can see um, that most of the areas on the map are um, around the, the downtown area. So uh, those are er areas that people were essentially using as a park and ride. So they would come as close to the downtown area, park their car, and then get on a, a, a bus or walk or take a bike into the downtown. And so to um, manage that, we have established the area parking permits. And there's 17, or 18 of those, and two of them um, have uh, adopted parking management plans, and they have um, a little they have more tools available to them in those districts, and that would be Northwest and the Central East Side. And um, they have been allowed to add a surcharge onto the base cost of their permits, and that surcharge goes back to their district um, for transportation demand management tools. So uh, council adopted guidelines that outlines uh, how we would like to see that those funds used within the district, and it really is to reduce the demand on a street parking where possible. Um, and that was really launched, I'm not sure if you guys have heard of the Transportation Wallet Program, but that is where um, it, was, it was developed in those two districts with the parking permit surcharge funds. 
And the last one is the Smart Park. So there are five operating garages in the downtown area and they uh, are publicly owned. They're owned by Peabot and operated by Peabot. And that is to support the downtown retail area. And um, that really is the mission of Smart Park is to support the mid-range um, stays and to support the uh, retailers in, in the downtown core. So see the next, so Peabot Schools is to proactively manage parking to support the adjacent land uses. So and to encourage turnover. So actively managing parking in the central city with meters and the surrounding areas with permits or meters and um, then the commercial corridors with time stays. So there's different tools that we have and we implement to help uh, different um, neighborhoods or land uses so that we can um, really manage the parking to fit their specific needs. Um, in a Main Street area such as Hawthorne or Division, um, currently they, they're looking at, they have time stays. We have had some requests to um, expand the management in those areas. Um, and we're in the process of doing that, but really we try to use the tools that fit the neighborhood the best to accomplish their goals. Okay, and then um, there are two adoptive policies that are currently directly connected to pricing the on-street system. And one of them is performance pricing, which I'll talk a little bit more in, in a second. Um, but performance pricing is, helps us, a, a, was adopted by city council to adjust rates. Um, second one is uh, net meter revenue. So in the mid 90s, city council adopted a policy so that every new meter district that was established after that point, I believe it was 1995, um, after the city recovers the cost for operating and maintaining the system, then we split the revenue with those districts. And so 51% of the net meter revenue goes back into the district to help fund transportation projects and programs. And so we really look at that as a incentive for people to act actively manage their parking. And, and meters um, are really a, a good tool for that in a lot of areas. Um, and so that is something that um, so far uh, we have added uh, a couple meter districts since then, uh, since the development of this or the adoption of this policy. And that would be uh, the Lloyd District was the first, and then Markham Hill, Northwest, and the Central East Side have all been adopted after we uh, implemented this policy, and we are in a process right now where we revenue share with them to help them um, fund transportation projects and programs in their districts, and they vary based on the, on the district. Some districts look at additional um, sidewalks or rapid flash beacons or, or things that help with safety on the street and some districts really are looking at um, how to expand bike town and how to fund that and, and those types of projects. So, um, and then the creation of, of new parking meter districts. So, um, we were in the process of uh, starting um, before COVID, we were in the process of starting the development of two new uh, parking management plans. And we were looking at um, using different tools to do that. And we have a parking management manual that was adopted by city council in 2018 and it outlines different tools. And right now, given the development patterns in Portland, a combination of permits and meters is, is really what we're looking at. So meters would be on the commercial street to manage the parking for um, businesses and customers and visitors to that area. And then the surrounding area would be a permit, a combination of a permit area so that um, employees and residents would have uh, use of th those streets um, in, in the surrounding areas. So let's see, next slide. So um, performance pricing. So in 2018, Council adopted uh, the Parking Management Manual, and a large piece of the manual is performance-based parking management. And that means um, it can be implemented a lot of different ways in different cities. Some people look at it as um, 
more of a dynamic pricing, but we're really starting at performance-based pricing. So it outlines a process for adjusting meter rates based on occupancy. So um, it was adopted in 2018 and we were actually hoping to be in the process of implementing our first round of performance pricing now, um, but that is on hold at this point. But um, what uh, performance pricing does with, as it was adopted by city councils, it allows us to adjust rates annually in the meter districts based on occupancy. So rates would go up or down depending on demand by 20, 40 or 60 cents an hour. Um, so that, and it would be based on the data collection and occupancy of, it, of an area. So what it would allow us to do is develop sub-districts and within um, a meter district. So for example, right now, downtown, the downtown meter district um, goes from Portland State all the way to the Pearl District. And those areas have very different needs for on-street parking. And by allowing us to develop sub-districts, we can tailor our management tools and rates and hours of operation to their specific need. So um, performance pricing allows us to develop um, sub-districts and then also would allow us to change rates based on occupancy. So the way the manual was adopted is what triggers a rate increase is occupancy is greater than 85% for three hours or more and then the occupancy is greater than 70% for five hours. So it shows a sustained demand on the system. And then we, depending on what the overall demand is or occupancy is, we'd be able to adjust those rates. Our goal is to reach an 85% occupancy, which means that there is one to two spaces available on a block face. So it reduces um, drivers circling the block looking for um, a parking space, which would reduce carbon emissions, it hopefully incentivizes people to really think about as the prices go up, whether driving their vehicle is really the best way to get to their destination for their specific trip. And so, um, we're ho as I said, we're hoping to do that now, um, but that has been actually put on hold um, until we can take data that we think accurately reflects the demand on the street. Right now, the demand, as you can imagine, is much, much lower um, than it would have been pre-COVID. So um, we're monitoring the occupancy on the streets right now and the number of transactions. And then uh, as we see those start to come back, then we would look at taking data and applying these tools or this system to adjusting those prices. So. I think that is the high overview of what we have right now for uh, our tools and policies. Thanks, Chris. And yep. Chris is the expert on all things parking. And that was just like yeoman's work, just to <laughs> summarize <laughs> all of it into three slides. So thank you so much. Yes. Chris will stick around if we yep. have specific questions about, um, about, uh, about parking parking pricing. I do see that Hal raised her hand. Hal, I'm going to yes. ask that question um, and then we're going to try to keep moving. I okay. think I saw another hand from Justin as well. Okay. I just wanted to flag that. Right. I don't know if we Justin still so needs. That's fine. We can take both. Okay. Have a I was just saying thank you. Like <laughs> high five. High five. <laughs> Hal, go ahead. Sure. So I do have a question. Have you looked at your data to see, um, you know, the enforcement of parking? Um, is the enforcement equitable? Um, does it show that certain areas are enforced more than others? Um, just, you know, using that equity lens, um, have you looked at your data to just kind of dig a bit deeper into that as far as the parking um, pricing strategy? I know that um, the Parking Enforcement Division does have different um, officers who do different beats in the downtown area and then um, go out around the city um, and they try to uh, have the officers out um, outside of the downtown area and in a regular basis so they have areas where they they monitor and then there also is service requests unfortunately i'm not as familiar with the enforcement piece 
of um, and, and how they deploy their officers at this point. So I, I can't talk about specifics. I just know that they do have different beats and they try to distribute the, the officers and, and the hours that they're enforcing throughout the city. How we can follow up and, and see if we can get some. Any yeah, Mike Krebs would actually be the best person to answer those questions for you. Great. I believe I saw Jonathan's hand come up. We can take one more quick question, but I just wanna make sure we're saving time for discussion. And just really quickly, Chris, in a normal year, and of course not this year, but roughly how much money comes into the city through these different parking strategies? Um, well, for um, the area parking permit price of that, of those permits is really cost recovery. Um, so every permit is $75 is what the current price is. And we issue about Thirty thousand in our eighteen areas in dollars annually. Chris, you cut out there. Well, you came back at the okay. very end. Can you just say okay? This so annual at the meter rates. So annually, we um, collect about thirty-six million dollars annually from from the on-street pay stations. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I don't believe there are other hands. Mariana, is that right? Actually, Sarah had her <laughs> hand up uh, right after, right before you said what you said. About Chris, you're just too so. great. You're just too <laughs> fascinating. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be nice and we'll take Sarah's question and then we're going to keep mo moving. Thank you. Um, I actually have two questions and I'm just going to ask them both. You can <laughs> not answer them if we don't have time. Um, I just would like some clarification about how the Smart Park mission and implementation actually align with the city's transportation goals um, and with this committee's charge overall. And then I'm also just curious about why Portland chose not to use really dynamic performance parking management um, and instead went through with this non-dynamic approach. Non-dynamic. Okay, so <laughs> yeah. with the Smart Park. Thanks. So um, the Smart Parks are obviously all located in the downtown area and um, the the intent of those is to supplement the, so I should start, I should back up a little bit. So the on-street system is really, our goal is to have short-term trips. That would be two hours or less use on-street. So the intent of the goal of the smart parks is for those mid-range, four hours um, uh, type stays. And um, the all of the smart parks where located and built and in um, conjunction with the retailers of downtown to support them. So the off street for the garages is just priced slightly less than the on street to help get people and those, those mid range stays into the garages and have it be affordable. Did that answer your question? I'll just jump in there too, Chris, and say that when we do move on, one of the seed ideas we want to talk about is around um, Smart Park, and we'll kind of echo some of the things that Chris just said. So there'll be more time to talk about this later. But well, okay. and can maybe and can I jump in too, really quickly, to just say I think to um, to Sarah's question, I you know one of the things um, that is true is that the city has multiple goals: our transportation system plan, our comprehensive plan. We have we have many goals and many policies. And um, I think one of the things that this um, task force is charged with is thinking about, you know, if we're narrowing in really on equity and an equitable system and a, and a sustainable system, you know, are there some things that you would suggest, you know, that, that's what we're here to talk about is are there some tweaks or, or bigger than tweaks um, to suggest, you, you know, to narrow in on those particular goals um, in a stronger way. So that's the, that's the conversation right now. Okay, okay I'll, real, and I will try and answer um, the dynamic versus performance pricing question quickly. So since 1938, the city has adjusted the on-street meter rates nine times. So we um, do not have a pro, the, before performance pricing and the manual was adopted by city council, we had a very cumbersome process that was outlined in our policy for, uh, for adjusting meter rates. And we did not do it often to reflect the need to use price as a tool to manage parking. So we're looking at performance pricing and our implementation of it as the first step 
to potentially, we could potentially get to dynamic pricing, um, but uh, we would like to get everyone who uses the system and um, our leadership in, um, in, a, in a, understanding the process and how we do it annually so they understand what, what triggers a price change and people understand um, what to expect and when. Um, and then the other piece of this is we're in the process of, of updating all of our on-street uh, pay stations. Our old, very old machines did not have the ability to change rates uh, very fluidly. And so by upgrading all of the on-street pay stations, we would have the ability to push down programs and um, adjust prices more frequently than perhaps annually. So this is, I look at it as sort of the, the first steps in what could be dynamic pricing in the future. Thanks, Chris. Justin, I see your hand. I'm going to ask that we push forward just to save time so we're already quite a bit behind and I want to make sure that we we can get all these questions asked and answered kind of as after we move through if that's okay. Um, thanks, Justin. So I want to thank Sarah too. I think she set up really well um, with her questions. A couple of the seed ideas that we want to explore with you and so you know to kind of bring it back to the charge of this group we are asking how can we build on those policies and um, adopted strategies that Chris just mentioned to advance the goals of POEM, to advance our climate and equitable mobility objectives. So I'm going to walk through three public parking seat ideas fast as I possibly can. Um, again, we could do an entire meeting on each of these. So we really appreciate kind of your grace and patience as we throw a ton at you and then save some time to discuss it more um, later in this meeting and in the months to come. So the first of those ideas that we want to talk about is just involving an increase of the parking base rate overall before we implement that performance-based parking uh, strategy that Chris just said. So in other words, we bump up the cost of parking across the city to, to send that signal and discourage drive alone trips. Um, this could make the potential of performance-based parking's ability to manage demand even stronger because it'd be starting from that, that higher level. Um, as as uh, Chris said, we, we haven't updated our meter rates very much since the 30s, um, and many meter districts in the city have not seen a rate increase in over five years, despite economic changes, population growth, and increasing demand in that time. Um, and then as Chris said, you know, once performance-based parking is implemented, then the rates would be adjusted based on that data collection annually, so rates could go up or go down. But this seed idea would be kind of a bump to, to get us started. Um, in some areas where um, the base rate is now, you know, too, too high, um, it could be lower than once we in, in implement performance-based parking. I want to point to the example of Seattle who have got the jump on us a little bit with performance-based parking. They've had a, a, it in place since 2014. And so there, for example, they have a similar max to us, $5, and I think it looked about 20% of their districts are at that max right now. With our rates today being $1 to $2, and we increase by that 60 cent margin, it could take five years for us to reach that level. Well, that's a lot of apples and oranges I'm comparing there, but that, that's kind of why we're putting this seed idea on the table. Um, we also do have to think though about the context of COVID-19, the pandemic and the recovery, and there's sort of a lot of different strands there. One is that with COVID recovery, um, people who do have mobility options and have choices today may be less likely or less inclined to take transit and more likely to drive. We're seeing that in other cities, a kind of uptick in driving. So raising the rates could send a signal there. On the other hand, we have to acknowledge that it's an economic, we're, we're facing an economic recession and think about the impacts there. Super brief overview. We're going to have a lot more time to talk about it in a minute. The second idea um, gets to one of Sarah's questions, um, and this is an idea that is um, under consideration in our parking division right now. So we're really excited to get the POEM task force's thoughts on this concept. And that would be to adjust the smart park rate structure to create a disincentive for commuter parking. So I don't want to repeat what Chris said about what the mission of smart park is, but you know, right now, um, we're kind of trying to hit that, that sweet pot. Still short-term trips. We don't want recurring long-term trips in those smart parks. Those we want to have be taken by more sustainable modes like transit. Um, but the smart parks do get the really short trips off the street. So what this proposal would do is it would maintain those short-term rates just below on-street rates to kind of facilitate that less than four-hour short-term trip there. Um, we'd have a medium term rate. So for hours five and six, there would be a, a rate there where right now it jumps to the all day rate after four hours. 
But then what we would do is with the all day rates, they would be higher than today. And so what that says to the person who drives downtown every day for work and is parking in the smart park, that sends a signal to them um, to consider that choice and, and consider if that's a choice they want to keep making. So it discourages that, that commuter parking. And the reason that the city um, has um, policies against reducing commute trips is really because um, they happen during the most congested times of the day. And they also are the recurring trips. So there are a lot of the vehicle miles traveled on our roadways. Um, I think I've covered a lot of the stuff on this slide already and I want to keep us moving. Um, uh, just one note on the bottom there in italics, you know, the, the example you saw on the previous slide, I think is sort of the latest iteration of how this could look. Um, there, with all of these strategies, there's different kind of design parameters we could consider. You could think about different rates um, in the garages based on different times of entry, maybe higher during more congested times. Um, Smart Park currently provides a swing shift and an evening shift special rate to reflect that demand is really different at different times of day. And the last one, again, that Sarah teed up so well for us is um, considering a move towards more variable and truly dynamic public parking. Um, and so what that would mean is, is where the rates change more regularly. They might change based on time of day. So we'd have different times of day rates because demand fluctuates during the day. It may mean that a system where we adjust the rates more frequently than once a year. Um, San Francisco, for example, that's called out there, they have had a, a variable parking system and they, they review theirs every six to eight weeks um, to make the, the adjustments and they have different rates per different time of day. Um, in a really Jetsons future, you could have parking rates change live, you know, based on what is happening on the street on the block face at that time. Um, and so just the context and things to consider here, you know, we, we've got the performance-based parking plan ready to, to be implemented when the time's right, and that will have that annual adjustment. Um, analyzing parking data takes time. This isn't something that right now that Jetson's future is, is we could just snap our fingers and put it in. It's a, it's a, it's a time-consuming process and um, requires technological shifts. So as Chris mentioned, we need to, um, we, the, we're doing the meter uh, upgrades to make this possible, but some of these even more futuristic or more dynamic systems would require more technological investment. So with that, I'm gonna be really mean and I'm gonna keep us moving into private parking. <laughs> um, and I wanna just pause here really quickly and say we, we, we know we don't wanna always have me and Shoshana being the ones that talk to you. We really like to bring in new voices. And so we really appreciate Chris being here. We also had intended to have um, Liz Horman, one of our transportation demand specialists here, to talk about private parking. She's the project manager for the transportation demand management action plan, which is a concurrent process. Um, Liz, unfortunately, is dealing with a family matter. So we're going to have me sub in for her and be a, a really terrible um, <laughs> second choice, but we, we wish her all the best and um, we'll, we'll document any questions that I can't answer or my colleagues can't answer and have Liz follow up on those and we, we look forward to having her at a future meeting. So just a few things to say and background about private parking. Um, you know, for, for parking management to be truly effective, as we said earlier on, we have to think about the public and the private side and a lot of the parking in our, in our city is private. And there's sort of two buckets of tools that we have as a city to, to make an impact, to manage private parking. One is on the supply side. So we can do things with our development requirements, our codes like setting parking minimums or maximums that can manage the supply. Um, we can require certain spaces that have, you know, that are only shared for car share, like zip car spaces or for carpool. Um, and then we can have kind of shared parking arrangements um, as well. The demand side is where pricing kind of comes bigger into play. That's where we can actually implement fees and send price signals in the private space, similar to what we just looked at on the part on the the, um, the uh, public side. Sorry, um, both of those are really important for managing demand. Um, however, to date, we have been very focused on the on the, the supply side. Um, through our city zoning code. We haven't ventured very far into the demand side and that's where we're really excited to dive in with POEM. And so demand, um, sorry, too many screens. <laughs> um, Demand-based strategies 
today, what we have on the books in Portland, um, they're, they're pretty informal and very site specific. So we did recently adopt a transportation demand management um, requirement into the zoning code. And so there are some developers for some developments that are required to create plans that prevent, reduce, and mitigate the impacts of development on, on pricing or on, on, uh, on the system. Um, and so that can be, you know, things within, within parking management. They have to manage their parking. Um, but it's, it's a narrow list of developers and developments that apply to that. They have to be located in a commercial mixed-use zone. They have to have more than 10 dwelling units. They have to be located close to transit and they have to be outside the central city plan district. It's a lot of, a lot of legalese there. Um, and so there's, there's these, this code does not specify, you know, which tools must be used, um, and they only apply to a very limited number of developments. So we have some gaps, or you can see them as opportunities uh, when it comes to managing uh, private parking. And so we are excited to dive into those with you and I'm gonna turn it over to Shoshana and take a deep breath and she's gonna walk through the three seed ideas on the private side. And you're muted, Shoshana. Okay, hi, <laughs> thanks. Um, so yeah, just like we did with the um, public side, we have a couple of sort of seed ideas for private side that we wanna talk through and I'm gonna go through them um, relatively quickly and then we'll sort of move to the uh, portion of the evening where we're actually going to try to virtually break you guys up into discussion groups and, and have some discussion about all of these things that we're throwing out. Um, so in on the private side, it's the three ideas we want to talk about are new fees on off-street um, private parking, requiring employers to provide a parking cash out option if they provide free parking to employees and um, potentially further regulations to sort of more aggressively unbundle parking costs from housing and real estate costs. And I'll talk about what that means in a second here. So for the first seed idea, um, it would be considering new fees or taxes on off street um, private parking. And this could really look you know, if there was interest, there was a lot we would have to explore. This could be done in, you know, in many different ways. Um, at, and we're just, you know, trying to get the conversation started. But it could either be sort of fees levied on the owner of a lot um, or on users of the parking area through something like an excise tax. And um, Sydney, Australia offers an example of the first kind where they impose a tax on a parking area to really try to control the supply of parking and generate revenue to invest in other modes. Um, and then Illinois offers an example of, um, they've recently passed um, a private parking operators, um, a tax on private parking operators. So they are required to collect an additional fee um, from parking users and it's 6% of hourly or daily weekly rates and 9% of monthly or annual rates. So it's a fee that then they, the, the private lots have to have to collect. Um, and estimates, this is sort of an old estimate, but from 2014, there is an estimate of over 177,000 unpriced private parking spaces in the city. So there's, you know, there are, there are a lot of private lots out there and private parking spaces um, that exist right now. And you know, the reason again to think about some of these things is that um, they have the potential, uh, you know, as, as we've been talking about, they have the potential to make parking more expensive, to help re in, in turn to help reduce demand for driving, potentially reduce the amount of driving that's happening in the city, making our system a little bit more efficient um, and helping with sustainability goals. Two, a new fee, a new tax could generate revenue, which again could be reinvested and something that we want to talk about when we get into discussion is what types of things um, would, would be interesting to sort of help to prioritize if there is some revenue. Um, and, and then three, they could impact developer and landowner decisions um, around the supply of parking, you know, potentially leading to redevelopment or existing or using existing parking spaces um, for different uses. Um, all that said, as we sort of think about this, as well as all the other areas, it, it, it centers around making parking more expensive, which of course has impacts for those who need to drive and who need to park. Um, so the things we have to think through. The second um, seed idea 
is in as um, requiring employers to provide what's called a parking cash out option. And this would be a regulation that would require employers who, who currently provide free or subsidized parking to offer the option to sort of cash out the value of the parking that they're providing. Um, and this could be in the form of actual cash or in the form of sort of subsidies for other forms of transportation. Um, and there's a, there are studies and indications that there's a lot of people in the Portland metro area who drive to work and who are given free parking. Um, and so again, there's, if, if employers are offering that, making it easy, making it cheap to drive, it, it is harder for folks who, you know, maybe have options and maybe would consider other things, but if it's, if parking is super easy, it's just harder for, for other, other um, modes to compete. Um, so cash out regulations really sort of put the decision more in the hands of the employee. Um, and they also help to encourage employers to consider the value of the, of the parking that they're offering to their employees. Um, in places where it's been implemented, cash out regulations have gained support in many um, ways from both the employers and the em employees. And the state of California has actually had a statewide cash out law for um, 28 years, I believe. And it's estimated that this has had a significant um, impact on the reduction of, of um, drive along trips. Most recently, Washington, D.C. Um, adopted a cash out law, although I guess it's still going through sort of final approval. Um, and in order to get this regulation passed, and I think they had to work with employers and there are a number of exemptions, so not all employers are um, are subject to this, but in general, now many employers who provide free or subsidized parking are required to offer their employees an alternative, and it's either um, employer paid transit benefits or cash or increased employer contributions to them and employees healthcare benefit. So it's a, di you know, it's a different way in which there are sort of price signals being shown, but it's not just charging more, it's sort of offering, offering different value in different ways. Um, and then the third idea is also sort of a different idea um, called unbundling parking from development, at least more than we do today. And unbundling parking separates parking spaces from the lease or the purchase price of a residence or a commercial space and sort of monetizes that space um, separately. So, you, so buyers and lessees only pay for the parking that they need. And this can happen right now um, voluntarily. Building owners can unbundle parking, but there's no regulations that require them to do so. So an unbundling requirement would ensure that people are really considering the true cost of parking when they're making real estate transactions. Um, so for example, if I'm a I'm an employer and I am looking for a spot downtown for me and my 50 em employees. Um, and you know, maybe I have a lot of employees and uh, some of them live outside the city and some of them drive in, but I also know that half of them take the bus and ride their bike or walk to work. Um, but when I'm going and looking to rent a space right now, I would, I would go and I would find my space and if it's, you know, a space for 50 people to sit, it would also come with 50 parking spaces and I, I would just have to, that's the deal that I have to get. Um, so if you're unbundling, um, I could find a space where, you know, I, I would get the space and I don't have to get the parking spaces or I could say, I want a space for 50 people to sit and I only want 20 parking spaces because I only have a few employees that I think will need it. Or if as an employer, I want to, um, you know, encourage all of my or as many of my employees as possible to get there some other way, I could say, I just want the space. I don't want the parking with it. Um, so again, it, it sort of has the, it, it helps people think about the value. It helps people when they're getting a space, think about the value. And it also helps um, the owners think about the value. So this has the potential for a few things. It has the potential to make real estate potentially more affordable. Um, and it also could encourage more sort of redevelopment of existing parking spaces um, if there's less demand actually when you, when you separate them out. Um, and again, a number of cities, uh, both Seattle and Santa Monica require unbundling today. Um, so those, again, at a sort of lightning speed were the three seed ideas for um, private parking. And we'll pause here. Yes, we'll pause for, I'm going to take at most three questions and, and let's try to make them clarifying of the factual information because I just really want to preserve um, discussion time for, for you guys. So I think I saw Sharifa's hand first. 
Street, but you might be muted. Yeah, yeah. Um, subsidized or subsidized parking? What do you mean by subsidized parking? Um, I uh, where an employers are offering it. I think sometimes people uh, they off they offer maybe the parking isn't free, but the employer is paying for some of it and offering it then at a at less than sort of the value of the parking to employees. Oh, okay. And I had another one and I'm flaking on it. Sorry. No worries. If it comes back to you, let us know. I see Monique's hand. Um, are we also? considering things like um, the parking permit program and updates so that it's easier to get those permits in place. Um, we actually tried to get one in our neighborhood and it was a really, really heavy lift. And also part of the feedback was, uh, how do you make sure it's equitable um, for people mm -hmm. that can't afford it? So um, updating that process might also help with the parking issue. Thanks, Monique. That's great. We'll, we have a slide in just a few minutes of kind of like what what else would we want to put on the table? So I'll I'll mark that down and we'll make sure that gets put on the list. Shoshana, anything to add? I think you know I think that's a good question. There is such an existing process with that one, um, so we should talk about if that's something that you know this this group would also want to recommend or if we. I think we would have to make sure that we pull in the folks who are who know about all the existing parts of that process. And it looks like Sharif has the second part of her question has come back. <laughs> yeah, um, you mentioned in, in a, uh, just a data point or whatever you said that, I forget what the number, but the majority of people who drive to the city can park for free, right? Majority of people who come to the city park for free. My question is, is that, have you guys figured out, broken that down? Like, is that private parking or that on street parking or what is that? Um, I believe that the, it's, it's that the majority of people on this is actually the, some statistics we have our metro area, the, but many people who are doing commute trips around the city are able to park for free. That's different than, I, and, and I don't think we have super great information about like downtown, if you were to look at how many people are parking in off street employer lots and how many people are parking on street and paying. And one of the things that we need to talk about if there's interest in any of these is there's some data that we're missing. Um, so there are a lot of off street private lots that people are, are driving to to get to their jobs and, and to go to their jobs. Um, but there's also a lot of people driving downtown to for non you know, to go shopping or whatever it is, and they have to pay on street. Well, I guess I'm considering, I mean, my neighborhood is a transit-oriented development neighborhood, Williams business area, and nobody provides parking for their employees. They just park on the street. So that's why, that's kind of where that question is coming from. So you're telling me that, that those specific numbers have not been collected. They, have, they, they, I'll just jump in here, Shoshana, and just say we, we were actually looking into numbers this morning. I mean, I think it's a, it's a challenge. We don't have great data. There is something called the Employer Commute Options Program. It's a statewide program that does a survey. We were looking into some of that data, but that's not a perfect data set. I think you're absolutely right, Sharifa, that in the central city, the, the dynamics are much different than, than out on the fringes and in the more suburban parts of Portland, where there's a lot of free parking in, in big surface parking lots. Um, but we, we recognize that it's a data need. And, um, and if, this is a, if some of these are strategies, this task force wants to move forward, we are going to have to talk about, about what's possible to get and how, how accurate we feel like we can get the data. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to move us along to our discussion so we can dive in. Um, so as a reminder, we just, we just threw tons of information out at you. We have sort of these six seed ideas on the table. Um, I'm not going to read them back to you, but they're there. They're, we, you've got the slides in your email so you can go back and reference those um, in between meetings because we're going to have a little bit of homework in between meetings so that we can make sure we're getting your, your comments and your questions about all of these. And then that point at the bottom of the slide here, we do want task force members um, to, to feel free to add ideas to this list that you don't see reflected here. Um, a lot of the parking ideas could probably be variations on these and we'll be able to capture that, but 
Monique just gave us a great example of something that might be an idea to add to this list. Um, before I move on, does anyone else have something they, they really want to make sure we're, we're voicing now that should be added? Okay, not, not seeing any hands pop up. We'll, we'll make sure that we add the, the permit process one and we'll put that on our exercise so that folks can weigh in on that in between meetings as well. But now we're very excited. We're going to use a new piece of Zoom functionality <laughs> with all of you. We're going to take a poll because we have um, about four, uh, 52 minutes left. We cannot talk about all six. Heck, we probably can't even talk about two anymore. Um, but we're going to take a poll to kind of gauge where you guys are feeling you would like to spend the remainder of this meeting focusing. That doesn't mean that the other strategies fall off the table. You're going to have a chance to weigh in on all those and see your fellow task force members' comments. But for tonight, I would like you to respond to this poll about how you'd like what you'd like to prioritize talking about. So please pick two of these um, that you would most like to dive into this evening. So I'm going to launch the poll. And and I guess just to just to further clarify, when we say to launch, what we're going to do then is break into small groups and and pull up that equitable mobility framework and sort of have discussion about well, you know, do we think this could impact? You know, how would it impact? demand, how would it impact affordability, what could, you know, how could we reinvest things, how would it impact sustainability, uh, you know, all of those areas. So to sort of talk through, and some of it with all of these ideas is very dependent on the details around it, mm -hmm. but to just begin again to have these conversations. So it looks like about a third of you have voted. This is very exciting for me, I get to see the back end of the interface. Okay, we'll leave it up for, let's say, 15 more seconds. So try to cast your votes. Okay, last call. There's, it looks like 20 of you have voted. I think there's a few more than 20 task force members on the call. So if you haven't voted, Going once, going twice. Okay. So here are the results. Very fascinating. I will share them. Um, so you should be able to see the bar graph on your screen. Um, what came out as what people want to talk about tonight um, are moving towards variable or truly dynamic parking. That's number one. And then just inching ahead of cash out at the end is unbundling and wanting to talk about that as a strategy. Um, but, it, but great to see that there's interest in all of these ideas. And as I mentioned, we're happy to also add more to this list. Um, so as Shoshana said, we're going to be doing an initial screening with our equitable mobility framework. And tonight we're going to talk about those top two just so that we can narrow it down and start somewhere. Um, I'm going to quickly paste into the chat um, a link to the equitable mobility framework so that you all have it. Actually, I'm having window issues. So Mariana or Michael, can one of you do that for me? Um, and as we do that, um, I just want to, you know, ask that as we go through the framework, you know, a reminder that we are prioritizing and leading with, with racial equity and prioritizing BIPOC communities. So as we think about Kind of exploring what these these strategies could mean in our different areas of our framework we want to keep that front and center we also want to consider the impacts on people with disabilities low-income individuals multilingual individuals and displaced communities as well um, and so i want to just kind of pause and say that there when we as we break into groups and we start talking about these strategies there's sort of two sides of the coin there's one, what's the impact of the strategy itself? So what could that do for moving people and goods and climate and health and safety? Um, there's also then how could we design that strategy? So what could we do to maybe um, give exemptions by fuel type or exemptions for low income folks? Um, and how would that further impact those categories? So kind of what's the impact of the strategy itself? The second side of the coin is revenue. And we know that pricing generates revenue. While that is not one of the stated goals of this effort, we know that that provides an opportunity to think about reinvestment um, and further impacts on equitable mobility. 
And so we're, we're going to ask you also to think about as, as you're kind of visualizing what the strategy might look like if it was put in place in Portland, also think about what, what might be your priorities for using that revenue. Um, what, uh, what might, we, we've thrown out some categories here, transit benefits, safety and access improvements, programs and services, so things like incentives and education, and then rebates and subsidies that can alleviate or mitigate the cost of a pricing strategy. But we'd really welcome you to kind of think, think in those categories or think bigger. Um, I'm going to skip this for now just because I want to get us to our conversation. Um, but so I'm going to turn it over then to Michael um, to, to walk us through the, uh, the, the tool that we are going to start using a little bit tonight. You're not going to see much of it tonight, but we're going to invite you to use it in an interactive way in between meetings. So Michael, can I turn it over to you? Yes. I, um, I'm excited to share um, this tool. Let me know if it comes through. Is that showing on your end? Okay, great. So I just want to give you a, a little like one minute um, sort of overview of this tool, but essentially it's an online whiteboard where we can all, um, you know, write notes and collaborate. And in our small groups today, we'll have a designated um, note taker from PBOT. So you don't have to um, you know, worry about that, but I do want to give you a sense of the lay of the land because after the meeting, we'll send out a link to this platform so um, you can take a look yourselves as well as comment on other strategies that um, we won't have time to discuss tonight. Um, but right now, I'm super zoomed out, so you can't really even see the text. And so, um, but I want to point out that there's six pods on there, and so those are the six um, pricing strategies. And in the lower right hand corner, um, there's some. Uh, there's sort of like a, a map view of where you are um, in the mural. And there's also this button you can click for um, tips on how to zoom in and out. Um, so, but I'm using a mouse, so I use the circular, um, the, the middle mouse pointer, I guess, um, to, to zoom in on it. And once I zoom in, that's when the text becomes legible. And so that's where you can see. And so from our poll, um, that was most popular, um, it was, you know, move towards more variable or truly dynamic pricing. And so on this grid, we have our questions, our four key questions across the top. And then down on the left, we have our um, sections from the equitable mobility framework. And I just popped the link of that um, into the chat box so you can um, pull that up um, to, to have that um, for reference as you think about these questions and there'll be a, um, a facilitator um, asking these questions verbally so you can, um, you know, have time to, to ponder um, with the mobility framework. But my hope is that when you answer these questions, you'll be able to also pull from um, all of the work that we've done in the equitable mobility framework. And so, for example, this first question, how could this idea advance equitable mobility in this category for Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities? So once I zoom in really close, then I can read the text. And it might, you know, someone might have a thought like higher prices may cause people to drive less at congested times. So that would make the system more efficient. Um, but that, and this can improve reliability of trips and increase connectivity. And revenues can also be invested in improving projects like Rose Lanes, um, improving reliability for our BIPOC community. So that's kind of like one of the pros um, of this. And then right next to it, our second question is what are the risks? Um, or the cons. What risks or concerns do we have about this idea's impact on equitable mobility for BIPOC communities in this category? And when I zoom in, for example, um, you know, we might say this would make parking more expensive at times, so that really impacts um, our BIPOC communities who often drive from far away when we think about the geography of where um, people are living. Um, and then this uh, third question is really acknowledging that um, you know, these are seed ideas and concepts. And so we may have like, you know, a lot of questions um, that, we, that we still want more information on. And so this is a chance um, to capture those sort of um, questions that will help us be better informed about it. And so um, somebody might have a question like, does this strategy increase revenues or reduce revenues? And that will kind of help us then think through some of the implications. And this fourth question is, could revenue reinvestment further help to impact equitable mobility? 
um, what revenue reinvestment areas would you prioritize? And so I think naturally, as we as we start to discuss these, um, it's it's sort of a natural inclination to think about well, you know, we need to you know put money towards something to to address you know, a concern that we're seeing. So as these ideas like percolate and come up, um, we'll have a note taker in these groups to jot down those um, ideas into this little platform. So that's my quick overview. Um, my one last note is, um, you know, when you get the, the link to this, um, in the top left corner, I've also like written out the, these like key um, concepts of, or rather sort of instructions. So if you um, want a little refresh on that, as well as there's a link to the equitable mobility framework up in the top left corner. And um, I think that's, I'm gonna say right now, Emma or Shoshana or anyone else, is there something else before we head out into our breakout room? I, I think you did great, Michael. So folks, I, I, we've gone a little bit over and I wanna maximize the amount of time that we have with you. So as we said, you know, this is the introduction to Mural. We're super excited to try it out. We kind of ask for your patience and, and grace as we learn the tool as well. And, and give us your feedback if it's really not working for you. Um, we're gonna try to just have the, converse, the, the breakout groups be more of a dialogue, but your note taker will start using this and then you'll get the link and be able to dive in um, after the meeting and, and provide additional feedback on all the topics that we, we aren't able to talk about tonight. Because of our limited time, I'm going to have two of the groups start with the moving towards more variable and dynamic pricing, and that's going to be Ingrid's group and Vivian's group. And then I'm going to have Marty and Eric's group start with unbundling. Um, and then you'll kind of see where, you know, when naturally you want to pivot to the other topic, if, if your group decides to pivot to the other topic. Um, so with that, without further ado, I'm going to break you up. We're going to, um, I'm going to let you stay there until I think 7.50. Um, so that we can come back and have kind of a quick wrap up. We're going to save a lot of time uh, at the beginning of our next meeting for better debrief as we can really unpack a lot of these strategies. But I, um, I also I'll say to my, my audience members, we are not going to break you out into groups. We're going to, you're going to stay here with me. You can also go get some dinner if you want and, or come back at 750. Uh, but we'd like the, the task force members to have some, some good space to talk. So um, I'm going to open all the rooms and be here for tech support facilitators if you need me. Uh, have a, have fun, guys. Okay, and then I had to see who isn't in a breakout group, so I can <laughs> put you put you back into a breakout group. Let's see. Sorry, I completely lost the thread. There were some fireworks that sounded like gunshots outside my house oh, and I no. suddenly was like what is happening so oh no I okay got very distracted no worries I'm just gonna go ahead and assign you Elizabeth to a breakout room and then you'll you'll get all your instructions then okay there we go audience members hi there i'm gonna go on mute and turn my video off if you need anything you just let me know um, but thanks so much for joining us this evening
Hi, Andy. If you can hear me, I see you there, and I am trying desperately to get you into a breakout group. I just think our computers are not liking each other today.
Welcome back, folks, as you get popped back into the main room with the wizardry that is Zoom. Um, I think it mutes you upon entry, just, just FYI. And we'll, I think everyone had 60 seconds to wrap up, so we'll, we'll all be back together in just a minute. Welcome back, folks. We're just giving everyone a couple more seconds to get in here. Great to see you all. I hope that was fun. It went like a blink of an eye for me. And I apologize to Andy, who got booted off the call, but I think got put back into Eric's group eventually. Maybe not. Um, but we'll, we'll do some troubleshooting after we're uh, in between the next meeting to hopefully have this not happen again. Um, let me just quickly share my screen one more time. So we decided to kind of uh, truncate the, the, the share out to give you guys more discussion time. Um, I do want to do just like a really quick round the table of our four note takers and see if you want to share kind of a top takeaway from your conversation or something that really stuck out to you, either a, a, a pro, a, a way that you felt that this a strategy you talked about could help advance equitable mobility or a concern you had or a question that came up. Um, can I start maybe with Shoshana? Sure. Um, it's hard to choose one thing. I think um, we spent the majority of our time talking about uh, the idea of, of mo truly more variable um, pricing. I think, you know, we, we really, we talked about both a fair amount of benefits and, and concerns and things we'd have to um, think about. I, you know, maybe the thing that stood out the most would ju is just the amount of sort of data and additional information we would need to, um, or the group felt like we, we would need to really sort of make solid recommendations. There's a lot of information about who's driving now and, and um, you know, different things like that, that, that we will need to craft policies moving forward. Great, thanks. Um, let's go to, to Mel and Eric's group next. Mel, do you wanna share something that stood out to you? You might be muted, Mel. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Sorry, I have many windows open. I was trying to figure out how to unmute. Um, yeah, we had a good discussion. There were um, sort of a lot of interesting questions that came up around um, sort of revenue reinvestment and the timing for this. Um, it sounds like in a lot of instances, um, it might be more at the point of development um, that this unbundling um, could be reinvested. Um, and, you know, I think there were just some additional questions of um, existing policy um, in Portland and then where this has been used in other places. Um, but, yeah, as Shoshana said, hard to pick one thing and <laughs> still digesting everything. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Let's go to uh, Mariana next. Hi, everyone. Um, Let's see, there was a lot of good conversation on the first topic. I think that the idea that uh, resonated the most uh, that came up in different ways was that uh, the idea of incorporating uh, like a one-stop system, streamlined system, so that uh, individuals who are low income can get the help that they need and they don't have to like go different places to get their um, low income treatment pass, right? Like ideally we'll have a centralized system so that will be uh, better coordinated and then for low incomes people don't have to like retell their stories and provide all the documentation that can save them time as well in the long run. Uh, another thing that came out just quickly regarding, um, let me see, uh, where are people coming from? That was very important as well, the geographic areas, where are they coming from in terms of different parts of the, of the region? Great, another, another data question too, yeah, thank you so much. 
And last but certainly not least, the guy who set the whole thing up, Michael, would love to hear the, the key takeaway for um, so your breakout. In, in my group, we talked about unbundling parking from development, and it really brought up a lot of questions around like, you know, are we kind of going after like residential unbundling or commercial unbundling and then thinking through, you know, if it's commercial, like how this impact a small business or salon owners um, or, um, you know, folks traveling in from far away. Um, and then, it, you know, how is that different from sort of like a, a, I guess a bigger company or just sort of like a tech company or just like different sets of um, companies. And I'll, you know, we also had a good conversation around like what, um, you know, what sort of case studies might be out there around like other impacts. Like we kind of had really good discussion around like would, um, if you have a space, like is there any tendency to hold on to this space and like hoard it? So just kind of exploring some of the other consequences that happen and just wanting to understand more um, what other places have experienced. Um, but there was some, you know, um, I guess really quickly, just comments that, you know, affordability um, would be really, ch um, could be increased for, for folks who like don't have a car. Like right now, um, if, if they're in a unit and they're, if it comes with a spot that they're not using, like they're kind of losing out on that. Um, but we see the other side of that too. So that's my summary. <laughs> I hope Thank I you. did justice. <laughs> <laughs> You did great under trying circumstances. <laughs> so what happens next, folks, with our last two minutes, um, you know, we, the reason we chose to use Mural and, and, and major thank you to Michael who set the whole platform up was because we, we want this not to be a one and done conversation. We wanted a, a platform that is interactive um, while we can't be together in person, allows you to both have the, the focused conversations in the meeting, but then also as you're thinking about this in the coming days, continue to contribute your comments and your thoughts um, and see what your fellow task force members have also thought. So we will send you a link to Mural so you can get in there yourself and kind of play around. It was really fun from my uh, vantage point to watch all the sticky notes get populated. It, it kind of simulates a sticky wall. Um, and so you'll be able to, to see all of those. You know, we will be doing a little bit of cleanup just because typing is really hard when you're trying to do it really fast and we'll, we'll clean up some typos and make everything easier to read. But we're gonna get that out to you tonight so that you can repeat the exercise that we did um, for the other seed ideas and for the seed ideas we talked about tonight. Um, we'll also make sure that we, we, um, we add the idea that Monique brought up and, and collect feedback on that, um, it, both between meetings, but then also um, at our next meeting. And we encourage you in that meantime to be sharing any relevant background materials or additional ideas that come up for you over the next few weeks with us um, in between. And we're, this is really iterative process and this is step one. We will be moving to tolling in the sort of second half of the next meeting, but we'll come back to parking and then we'll again revisit parking. If you remember, Shoshana talked about that October through December, really refining, filtering down and getting to the recommendations we might wanna move forward. Um, our next meeting is a month from today, uh, the second Monday in August, which is August 10th. Hard to believe we're already almost in August. Um, and as I said, we'll be recapping parking, reviewing the feedback that you provided in the mural um, identifying kind of what from this seed idea list and any additional ideas we want to move forward for further technical analysis. And then we'll start all over again um, with a different typology tolling. Um, and we're really excited to dive into that with you. Um, we are right at eight on the dot. Um, if there are any kind of final thoughts, feel free to shoot your hand up. But other than that, you guys are, are well, ready or willing to go. And uh, thank you so much for spending your, your evening with us. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank you. Y'all have a good night. Yes. Thank good night. You. Stay safe. Thanks, everyone. I miss seeing you guys in person. I know. <laughs> one day soon. I was like, I hope we can meet a park, you know, 10 feet apart. <laughs> Bye, Sharifa. I can't stay for very long because I've been getting an F on the mom factor lately. Hmm. But um, just to read. Go ahead and stop recording right now. That'd just be great. So you know.